you have difficulties and problems that come along, we need to go to the Word of God because Paul went through so many different things. And if you go to 2 Corinthians, the 11th chapter, you will find, boy, Paul really went through a lot of things. And though we have gone through things and some traumatic things, nothing like he went through. So the rest of the message for this Sabbath is we're going to do a survey in First and Second Timothy for the instructions to an elder that Paul gave to Timothy. Okay, so let's come to First Timothy, the first chapter, and let's begin there. And we'll look at selected sections which have to do with doctrine, because doctrine becomes very important. And this way, doctrine means teaching, didaske. Okay? And that comes from the noun teacher didaskalos. So Paul writes, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the commandment of God our Savior, and of the Lord Jesus Christ, who is our hope. To Timothy, my true son in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. Uh, which is this. The only way we get grace, mercy, and peace in times of trouble and affliction is when we come to the Word of God and use the Spirit of God and ask God for help and for strength and understanding and His love and His truth, and yet be willing to stand for the truth in spite of anything. So he continues, When I was going to Macedonia, I exhorted you to remain in Ephesus. Now we'll look at something in Ephesus here in just a minute in order that you might solemnly charge some not to teach other doctrines, nor to pay attention to myths and endless genealogies which lead to empty speculation rather than edification from God, which is in faith. Okay. Now the purpose of the commandment is love out of a pure heart and a good conscience, and genuine faith. Now notice what he says. From which some, having missed the mark, have turned aside unto vain jangling, desiring to be teachers of the law, neither understanding what they are saying nor what they are strongly affirming. Now we know that the law is good if anyone uses it lawfully. Okay. So he had the problems there. Now hold your place here and come to Acts 20 because we'll come back. But come to Acts 20 where Paul talked to the elders in Ephesus. And remember, this epistle to Timothy was when he was the main leader there in Ephesus. Let's pick it up here in verse 18. Acts 20 and verse 18. Now he had all of the elders come down to him in Milpitas because he didn't have time to stop by Ephesus as he was on the way to Jerusalem. But he knew he wouldn't see them any longer. So let's see what he said, beginning verse 18. And when they had come to him, he said to them, you know how from the first day that I came to Asia and all the time I was with you, I served the Lord with all humility, with many tears and temptations, which came upon me through the plots of the Jews. And how I did not keep back anything that was profitable, but preached to you and taught you publicly and from house to house, earnestly testifying both to the Jews and to the Greeks, repentance toward God and our, toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? And now behold, I'm bound in the Spirit and I'm going to Jerusalem, not knowing the things that will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit fully testifies in every place, saying, 
that bonds and tribulation await me. But I myself do not take any of these things into account, nor do I hold my life dear to myself so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry that I receive from the Lord Jesus to fully testify of the gospel of the grace of God. And now, behold, I know that you all, among whom I have gone about proclaiming the kingdom of God, shall see my face no more. Wherefore, I testify to you on this day that I am pure from the blood of all, for I have not held back from preaching to you all the counsel of God. Take heed, therefore, to yourself. Now, all of us as elders, we need to take heed to ourselves. Okay? That is, we are to be self-correcting. Now, what does that mean? That means with the Word of God and the Spirit of God, and this applies to everybody as well, we need to be self-correcting ourselves as led by the Spirit of God. And this can only be done when we're studying, when we're praying, when we are living the way that God wants us to. And it's God's Spirit who will lead us to repentance of those things. See? Take heed, therefore, to yourselves and to all the flock among you, which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to feed the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. Now, this is telling all elders this. The church of God belongs to Christ, and we are teachers to help all of us together with the Spirit of God the Father and Jesus Christ in us so that we learn and we have the instructions of the Holy Spirit of God on how to live, how to act our lives, and how to grow in grace and knowledge and overcome so we can be in the kingdom of God. That's the whole purpose of it. Brethren are not possessions for any elder. See? They do not belong to him, which he purchased with his own blood. All right? For I know that after my departure, grievous wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And that happened. Okay? We've seen it happen in our day. How many times over and over again? From among your own selves, men will arise up speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after themselves. Watch, therefore, remembering that for three years I ceased not to admonish each one night and day with tears. Okay? So Paul had his whole life and everything in it. We can be thankful for what Paul did and what he wrote. Thankful we have the word of God as it is. Okay. Now I commit you, brethren, to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all of those who are sanctified. Okay. Now, Let's come back to 1 Timothy, the first chapter. Verse 14. 1 Timothy, the first chapter, verse 14. But the grace of our Lord God abounded exceedingly with faith and the love that is in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of full acceptance. So we have to keep this in mind. Okay? All of us, but especially the elders. We have to realize we are here to teach the word of God. And so that the brethren can themselves, with the spirit of God and with the word of God, be able to grow and overcome. Until we all come to the unity of the faith, as he says in Ephesians. This is a faithful saying worthy of full acceptance that Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the chief. Okay. Now, 
Let's come here to verse 18. This charge, charge of everything that's in 1 Timothy, I am personally committing to you, my son Timothy, in accordance with the prophecies that were made long ago concerning you in order that by them you yourself might wage a good warfare. Now that's quite a statement, isn't it? A good war, okay? Because overcoming human nature, overcoming Satan, the devil, and overcoming the world, and overcoming our own carnal nature is a war, a spiritual war, okay? And here's how we do it. Verse 19, holding the faith and a good conscience from which some, having cast aside a good conscience, have made themselves shipwreck in regard to the faith of whom are Hymenius and Alexander, whom I turned over to Satan in order that they may learn not to blaspheme. So look at how strong that was, how strong the problem was during Paul's day. Okay. that he wrote this way to Timothy. Okay, Now, let's look at some other scriptures here. Come to chapter 2 and verse 7. Okay, Chapter 2 and verse 7. He said, verse 7, For this purpose I was ordained a preacher and apostle to speak the truth of Christ. I do not lie, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. Okay, so that's, he's reminding them what they need to do. Okay, chapter 3, verse 15. Okay, 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 15. He says, but if I should delay, you have these things in writing so that you may know how one is obligated to conduct himself in the house of God, which is to church of the living God, the pillar and foundation of the truth. So that's how important that the church of God is. And even though we go through trials and difficulties, and even though there are times that a lot of people are alone, you're really not alone when you have the Spirit of God. And especially today when we have these things that we have like the live streaming exactly as we are doing. And so that facilitates us assembling together on the Sabbath wherever we are. Okay? Chapter 4, verse 1. Now this also becomes important because we've seen how this applies as well. Verse 1, chapter 4. Now the Spirit tells us explicitly that in the latter times some shall apostatize from the faith and shall follow deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. Now, whenever these come, they do not come in the way of great evil to start with. Satan saves the great evil for later on. And that's where we are today in America, because they're down through the last, how shall we say, 50 years or more plus, some say 100 years, that the nation has been going down and rejecting the morality that they had. Okay. And now look at what we have when Satan takes over. Everything becomes sinful. Everything becomes hateful. Everything comes out of, out of true proportion. And we have troubles and difficulties. And people dedicated to the evil that they're perpetrating, okay? Speaking lies and hypocrisy, verse 2, their conscience having been cauterized with a hot iron, okay? Now, come over here to verse 13. This is quite a verse, okay? This is what we are to do. Here is how we can survive all of these things, okay? Okay? We already covered how to rightly divide the word of God. And that's imperative because you can see what happened from this latest example when you don't rightly divide the word of God and you bring in things that change the doctrine or the teaching of, of atonement to such an extent that it's almost like 
trying to justify Sunday keeping over Sabbath keeping. Okay? Now, verse 13, until I come, devote yourself to reading, to encouragement, and to doctrine. Okay? Doctrine. A lot of people, you, you, you've often heard this. Doctrine divides, but love unites. That's what they said when they were tearing the church apart. And what they were actually doing, tearing it apart while they were dividing it, blaming the doctrine rather than looking at the truth of the doctrine so that there would be unity. How else are we going to have any unity and understanding what we need to do if we don't go to the Word of God? It won't happen, okay? Do not neglect the spiritual gift that is in you, which was given to you by prophecy with the laying on of hands of the elderhood, okay? Now, that's important. Remember when you were baptized, had hands laid on you to receive the Holy Spirit, or you were ordained as an elder, you had hands laid on you to be an elder, to serve the people of God. See? So he's reminding all of us, remember that day and the importance of that day. Okay. Then he says, meditate on these things, give yourself wholly to them so that your growth in the faith may be apparent to all. Be diligent with yourself. That's what we all need to do, see? Be diligent with ourselves. See? Now, here's a rule. A good rule. As I mentioned about correction. If you correct yourself with the Spirit and Word of God, then you don't need any elders to correct you, and it, God won't correct you. See? Now, if we go so far astray that we got way out there on the fringes and coming back into the world and we don't repent like happened down in Southern California, then along came Sunday worship and 40% of the church went with it. See? Why? Because none of them were studying and praying like they ought to. And the elders were not being self-corrected by the Spirit and Word of God. Okay? Be diligent with yourself and with the doctrines. Continue in them. For in doing this, you will save both yourself and those who hear you. Now, that's quite a testimony, isn't it, huh? Yes, indeed. That's why we need to preach the Word of God. See? And how many times have we heard the truth of God, the truth of God, the truth of God? That's what we need. And we can't come along and twist that truth to make it mean something we do not want. See? Or that God doesn't want. Or that the brethren don't want. And we've all been battle scarred. Okay? Just a little sidebar. I talked to Bonnie Orswell here just the other day, and she reminded me of all the spiritual battles she went through with the breakup of Worldwide and the subsequent other churches, and she had been with a number of those other churches. Okay. And she has said that Christian Biblical Church of God is the place where she hears the truth. And that's incumbent upon all of us as elders that that is true. And all of the brethren as well, that that is true. All right? Let's come to chapter 5 and verse 17. Chapter 5 and verse 17. Okay. Let the ordained elders who are leading well be counted worthy of double honor. Okay? especially those who are laboring in the word and doctrine. That's what we are all to do. That's quite a thing. Okay. 
Verse 18, for the scriptures say, do not muzzle an ox treading out the corn, and the workman is worthy of his hire. Do not receive an accusation against an elder except on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Well, that's how this event that we just went through came up. Those elders who sin should be corrected in the presence of all in order that the others may also fear. And that's what we have done. We're not trying to hide anything. We're not trying to to make the mistake of when there is something really grievous that has been done, like this atonement event, to hurry and bring someone right back. Now, we saw that in Worldwide. When it was first discovered of all of the sins by the leading evangelist who was on doing all the radio programs, they sent him off to Colorado to be fasting and praying and to come out of all of the troubles that he was in. But because when he left, the income plummeted straight down, and so they hurried up and brought him back before there was real repentance. So what did that lead to? That led to him having later to be expelled, and then he continued the same practice in that church, and he had to be expelled, and he continued the same practice in that church until the day that he died. Okay. So we need to understand what he's saying here, see? So he says, verse 21, I charge you before God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the elect angels that you observe these things without prejudice and let nothing be done by partiality. So that's what we have tried to do in this particular case. And it has been difficult and grievous as well. Sometimes there are things we have to do that are not pleasant. But nevertheless, they have to be done. Just think about what Jesus went through in order to be our Savior. Okay? Coming in the flesh. And all of the religious leaders hating him, rejecting him, and wanting to kill him. Okay? And finally, he was betrayed, arrested, convicted, and crucified. And all the things that he went through, for what? To be the sin offering for the whole world, for all human sin, as we know in the plan of God, past, present, and future. And that's another reason why we have the New Testament, so we can be kept in, in mind of that. All right? Now, let's come to chapter 6, because there are a number of things here. Okay? Let's pick it up right in verse 3. If anyone teaches any different doctrine and does not adhere to the sound words, even those of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the doctrine that is according to godliness, he is proud and knows nothing. Rather, he has a morbid attraction to questions and disputes over words from which come envy, arguments, blasphemy, and wicked suspicions, vain reasonings of men who have been corrupted in their minds and are destitute of the truth, men who believe that gain is godliness from such withdraw yourself. Okay, So we've all had to do that, right? We have seen that, right? And we're trying to take care of the situation before that develops here. And we wish, as I said in my last statement, that there is repentance. We wish that there is a return. And we do everything we can to facilitate that. Okay? Verse 13. Okay? Verse 13. I charge you in the sight of God. Well, this is to all elders. Comes right down to us. We all have a charge from God 
concerning the word of God, concerning the truth, concerning how we are to conduct our lives who gives life to every living thing and Christ Jesus, who in testifying before Pontius Pilate gave the exemplary profession of faith, that you keep this commandment, everything that's in 1 Timothy, without fault, without rebuke, until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. So, he isn't here yet, so this applies to us directly as elders. Which is in his own times, the blessed and only Savior will make known the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone has immortality dwelling in the light which no man can approach, whom no man has seen, nor has the ability to see, to whom belongs eternal honor and power. Amen. That's quite a thing for him to write these things for us to live by, okay? Then he says, verse 20, O Timothy, guard the doctrine. That's what we're trying to do. Which has been entrusted to you, avoiding profane, empty babblings and contradictions of false knowledge that is called science, okay? Now, what happens when people get wrapped up in false knowledge and false application of the truth? The last verse. Through which some who are personally professing these false views have missed the mark concerning the faith. Grace be with you all. Amen. Okay? Now then. There are some other things here in 2 Timothy. All right. Now, we've covered the main thing we want to cover there, and that is rightly divide the word of God. And chapter 3, that the word of God, every word is what? God breathed. And that's how we need to do it. Now let's come to 1 John, the epistle of 1 John. Okay. Now he was always he was also writing about some of these very things. Okay. And he was seeing how these things were coming. So let's come to chapter two. First John two and verse fifteen. Which is really applicable today because we have so much of the world around us and near us and coming into our own homes through the digital devices, including television, that we have. Do not love the world, nor the things that are in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Because everything that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pretentious pride of physical life, is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world and its lust is passing away, but the one who does the will of God abides forever. Then notice what he says next. Because this happens, and it was happening then. Okay? Little children, it is the last time. Now, it was the last time of the apostolic age at that time. Today, it is the last time in actual time according to the plan of God. They went out from among us, but were not of us, because if they were of us, they would have remained with us. Nevertheless, they have left that they might be exposed to show that they all were not of us. But you have an anointing from the Holy One, and you have knowledge of all things pertaining to salvation. Okay? So then he says, that's able to make you wise. Okay? Now, let's come to chapter 4 and verse 1. So we see that what we covered was happening to all of the apostles 
and all of the churches at the same time. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirit. How do we test the spirit? Okay. Well, sometimes there are spirits that come along that are not from God that like to inject into our minds things of this world. That's called the power of the prince of the air, who is Satan, the devil, and his demons. Okay. Because many false prophets have gone out into the world, which tells us what? When there are false prophets, what's with them? A demon. By this test, we know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not from God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard was to come. And now it is already in the world. Okay. But verse 4, you are of God, little children, and have overcome them because greater is he who is in you than the one who is in the world. They are of the world. Because of this, they speak of the world, and the world listens to them. We are of God, and the one who knows God listens to us. The one who is not of God does not listen to us. By this means, we know the spirit of the truth and the spirit of the deception. Then he says, after that, we should love one another as God loves us. Okay, now then, we come to John, the second epistle. It's a real short one, and it's quite, quite a powerful one. And he also said, okay, let's start here with verse 12 to show you how overwhelming the apostasy was becoming. I have many things to write, but I do not want to convey these things to you with paper and ink, but I hope to come to you and speak to you face to face in order that our joy may be completely full. Then it says in chapter 3 that Diotrephes was even casting out brethren that were following John. And wouldn't even allow them to come to church. Okay. So let's come back and read some more verses in 2 John. Okay. Right here in verse 1. And notice what it says. It has to do with truth and commandments and righteousness. And he emphasizes that. So this is what we need in the world today. Because we all know as we look at it, and a lot of people are looking at the upcoming election, which is going to be next week, that what? They hope that it will change a lot of things. Well, we will see. Okay? Verse 1. The elder to the chosen lady and her children whom I love in truth, and not I alone, but also all those who have known the truth. See? There it is. That is the key. For the sake of the truth that is dwelling in us and shall be with us forever, grace, mercy, and peace shall be with us from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, in truth and love. Okay. I rejoiced exceedingly that I have found among your children those who are walking in truth exactly as we have received commandment from the Father. Now, that's quite a statement there too, isn't it? Because every word that we have comes from the Father. What did Jesus say? I teach exactly what the Father taught me to teach. I speak exactly what the Father taught me to speak. And the words that I speak to you are from the Father. Well, likewise, with everything in the Word of God, it all comes from the Father. See? And we need to really look at that and cherish that and live by that. Okay, verse 5. 
And now I beseech you, lady, not as though I am writing a new commandment to you, but that which we have observed from the beginning, that we love one another. And this is the love of God, that we walk according to his commandments. Chapter 5 and verse 3 says, this is the love of God that we keep his commandments. Now here he repeats it a little bit differently, that we walk according to his commandments. This is the commandment, exactly as you have heard from the beginning, that you might walk in it, because many deceivers have entered into the world. Look at what they were putting up with, and what were they doing? They were coming and trying to marry doctrines of paganism to Christianity. Question, have they succeeded? Yes, indeed. Where has that led? Well, you can see from the, how it is in the world. Many deceivers have entered into the world. Those who are not do not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. This is the spirit of the deceiver and the antichrist. Watch out for yourselves. Okay, So we all have to be on guard in order that we may not lose the things we have accomplished, but that we may receive a full reward. Okay. Anyone who transgresses and does not continue in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. But the one who continues in the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not Bring this doctrine, do not receive him into your house, and do not say to him, welcome. For anyone who says welcome to him is partaking of his evil works. Then, as we read that, he had many things to say to them, but would want to come and say it in person rather than writing it out. So there we see the conflict that we come up against. And I'm sorry about all of the difficulties that came about with this atonement event. I'm glad that there are the brethren and the elders who alerted, were very alert to this thing from the beginning. And I'm very sorrowful that it has turned out the way that it has, as well as many others connected with knowing of this event. So we wish that there be repentance and reconciliation and restoration. Whether that can be, that is strictly in the hands of those who need to come before God in repentance and to make it happen. So we hope that it will. If not, then we keep praying for them, asking for God to bring them to the understanding of themselves, like the prodigal son who left, okay? He left, and he had to go suffer until what? He came to himself. Then he came back to the Father. Well, likewise, that has to be with everyone who has difficulties and have gone on their own, hope that they come to themselves and come back to God. So thank you for listening, and I hope that this helps clarify everything and bring us to the point that we need to be and know that we need, as the Apostle John wrote, to be on guard, to be alert of the things in the church and in the world. So until next Sabbath, so long, everyone.